Hello, am I audible? Okay. So, hello. Can I start now? Yeah, sure. Okay, so today I'll be discussing about cardiac morbidity, mortality, prevention, and protection. This is a very vast topic, but I'll be discussing more about the importance of statin therapy, a uh, role of as a primary prevention, and uh, its role of the occurrence of cardiovascular disease, secondary prevention, and then uh, we'll be talking about a little bit about COVID-19 and statin therapy. So. These are the important aspects that I'm going to discuss today. Prevention is better than cure. You all know about the facts. Little bit of epidemiology, then uh, primary and secondary prevention, and lastly COVID-19 and statin. So, uh, since the CRIAR coverage trial, we know that the PCI has not changed the rates of mortality as compared to medical therapy in patients with chronic stable ischemic heart disease. However, uh, the symptomatic relief of angina is definitely there with PCI and intervention. However, the basic pathophysiology in the occurrence of cardiovascular disease need to be targeted properly with optimally uh, guideline-directed medical therapy. And one of the most important aspects is to treat your hypercholesterolemia with the proper hypolipidemic drugs. And it will be more prudent and cost-effective to manage patients medically until unplanned revascularization is needed. So this is one of the important aspects where uh, the primary prevention starts. So for early control of the risk factors of cardiovascular is very much needed. The greater the number of risk factors in control, the higher the probability of survival. Lesser will be the ultimate spend on treatment. And more effective strategies are, however, needed to achieve comprehensive risk factor control, including healthy behavior. So uh, these are the few data from all over the world getting the prevalence of increasing prevalence of ischemic heart disease in India as well as all over the world. And with the time, you are facing, uh, I think, uh, the, one of the largest burden of the cardiovascular disease. Data from contemporary acute coronary syndrome registries in India and have been compared with the large European and US registry. And the ACC acute coronary syndrome registry and Indian registry in metropolitan hospitals have also been reported and that has been depicted here. You can see almost uh, comparable levels of prevalence in terms of cardiovascular disease and uh, the mortalities, morbidities, overall prevalence of underlying comorbid conditions are almost same. And the, the daily adjusted life care loss is also high. It has a huge impact. You know, the four important risk factors are high blood pressure, hypertension, high cholesterol level, high fasting blood glucose, high level of glycemia, diabetes, and obesity. And this is where it has been seen that in the Asia Pacific region, the ACS is now a leading cause of mortality, and it is accounting for almost half of the global burden. That's pretty high. And less than 50% of the patients across the Asia Pacific region attend the NCEP3 low density target level. That's a good thing. However, if you think of the other way, that more than 50%, more than 50% of the patients do not achieve the targeted level of cholesterol, they should be achieved. In the industrialized Western world, improved adoption of evidence-based recommendations over the last decade strongly correlates with the 25% reduction in both in hospital as well as post-discharge ACS related mortality. And registry-based data from Asia Pacific region suggests that ACS related mortality rates have remained relatively high, 5% during hospitalization and up to double this at one year post discharge. Therefore, it is very imperative to control your comorbid risk factors, which are actually the contributing factors for the cardiovascular disease. A consistent observation in Asia Pacific region has been the strong emphasis on benchmark short term clinical outcomes in hospital events and those occurring within six months of the index events. And relatively weak emphasis on long-term outcome associated with inherent challenges, long-term follow-up per se and maintain compliance. So in this part of the world, more resources are basically required for patient public education towards test and awareness, 
need for compliance, effective primary lifestyle changes, and secondary prevention. These are not sufficiently robust at present, which contributes markedly to protract a total ischemic time, that is prolonged symptom to treatment times in India. Adoption of guidelines recommended pharmacotherapy is poor, but both the short and the mid um, medium term appears to be determined by the factors other than the risk of a recurrent failure. We do have a apricot working group suggestion that is the longer term patient surveillance is needed. Greater patient education, pain awareness, compliance, primary secondary prevention is very much important. Sometimes it is very difficult to access to the healthcare from certain geographical challenges are there that has to be overcome. The adoption of value based over cost based healthcare system that is very important. The group recommended a greater emphasis on improving long term outcome in agriculture. The poor patient compliance and adherence may be improved through community approach and to record adherence at 12 months, possibly via more use of mail, telephone, questionnaire or during hospital visit. Selected high risk and low risk compliance patients may then be entered into a compliance pathway to allow focus of resources towards patients most at risk. Technology-based solutions such as telemedicine may also aid community outreach programs by augmenting the need to commute long distances between remote regions and healthcare facilities. And greater patient education is needed to improve the awareness of the ACS and the need of primary and secondary prevention. The predictors of all cause mortality and ischemic events within and beyond one year after an acute coronary remain remain same. And if you follow this with registry, you'll find that at the end of one year it is 4.7%, at the end of second year it is 8.3%, at the end of third year it is 11.7, and 15.1% at the end of fourth year. So it is very important to control your contributing underlying pathophysiology over a long period of time. Otherwise, the recurrence of cardiovascular events will go high. So we do have a PICO registry, which incorporated 10,568 patients. From these 4942 are admitted with ST elevation marker infarction, and the rest are non stas And it was followed for one and two years regarding this underlying pathophysiology comorbid conditions. And the risk factors which are found basically associated with the occurrence and the recurrences of the cardiovascular events are older age, lack of coronary revascularization, raised creatinine, low hemoglobin level, previous cardiac disease, previous COPD, raised glycemia, male sex, and certain geographic location. And the low ejection fraction, poorer quality of life, low BMI, lost the predictive power after one year. So it is very important to control the traditional as well as the novel risk factors which are modifiable so that the recurrence of the cardiovascular events can be prevented. This is the recommendations from 2019 ACC guidelines regarding the primary prevention. It is, uh, it is very prudent to follow details. If you have your LDL cholesterol level more than 190, no risk assessment is needed. You can stay to go for high intensity statin therapy. That is a class one recommendation. If you are diabetic and falls below 40 to 75 years of age, moderate intensity statin therapy is recommended. That is also class one recommendation. Age wise, zero to 19 years, lifestyle prevent or reduce ACBD risk. Diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia needs a statin therapy. Otherwise, most important thing is prevention of the risk factors, prevention of the development of the risk factors. That's why the lifestyle changes are important. Age 20 to 39 years, same applies unless and until your LDL cholesterol is more than 160, or if you have a strong family history of premature ACVD, you can go for that in therapy. If your age is more than 40, and you are still non-diabetic, that's a very good thing, but yet you need to assess for the ACVD risk score. It is available, and you have to calculate the risk score. If you are less than 5%, low risk, risk discussion, Emphasize the lifestyle to reduce these risk factors. If you fall below 5, below 7.5%, 5 to 7.5%, that's a borderline risk zone. Again, the discussion and the initiation of statin therapy may be needed, provided your risk is high, along with other comorbid conditions. 
if it is more than 7.5 percent but below 20 percent that is the intermediate risk again the risk discussion is needed and it favors that in therapy to reduce the LDL cholesterol by more than 30 to 40 percent 30 to 49 percent if you're not certain you can go for calcium scoring it is more than 100, it is better to be on statin therapy. If your risk is very high, more than 20%, initial statin therapy to reduce LDL cholesterol more than 50%. That's the highest statin therapy. And in this scenario, basically, if you do have doubt and your risk factors and the ACVD risk calculation is less than 20%, you can opt for a calcium scoring system before initiation of statin therapy, even after lifestyle changes if your LDL cholesterol level is high. What are the risk factors that you might be considering before starting this? The family history of premature HCVD, persistent elevated LDL cholesterol level more than 160, MG5DL, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, conditions specific to particular women like uh, preeclampsia and the premature menopause, inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis, OASIS, and uh, particular South Asian ancestry where uh, the risk is high, strong family history. Persistent elevated lipid levels, high level of HSCRP, ongoing inflammatory activities, high level of lipoprotein A, APOB, more than 130, and history of peripheral arterial disease with ankle vessel index less than 0.9. These are the, some nutrition and diet and exercise and physical activities. These are guidelines. It's very important. The class one recommendation is that a diet emphasizing intake of vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, whole grains, and peas is recommended to decrease the HCVD risk factors. Replacement of saturated fat with dietary mono unsaturated and poly unsaturated fats can be beneficial to reduce HCVD. A diet containing reduced amounts of cholesterol and sodium can be beneficial to reduce HCVD risk. As a part of a healthy diet, it is reasonable to minimize the intake of processed meats, refined carbohydrates, and sweetened beverages to reduce the HCV risk. Regarding exercise, an adult without any such contraindication should engage in at least 150 minutes per week of accumulated moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity to reduce the HCV risk. So, regarding the cholesterol guideline i have already said this and recommendation for lowering cholesterol should be followed by proper assessment of how low you have achieved your level cholesterol the abcd is very beautiful a is for assess the risk for aspirin b for blood pressure control c for cholesterol don't forget c for smoking cigarette smoking d for your diet and d for diabetes and e for exercise I won't be discussing about the NSTACS other management, but the lipid lowering drugs is very important post occurrence of acute coronary syndrome. And statins are recommended in all such patients. The aim is to reduce the LDL cholesterol by more than 50% from baseline and to achieve LDL cholesterol less than 55. That is a class one recommendation. If the LDL cholesterol goal is not achieved, even after four to six weeks with maximally tolerated statin dose, combination with AGSMI is recommended. And if you're still not achieving your target level, you can use PCSK9 inhibitors. We do have now the data of using PCSK9 inhibitors in post hs patients. So these are the primary and the secondary prevention of use high dose statin therapy. And aggressive lowering of LDL for cardiovascular protection has already been established. What is mean by aggressive lowering of LDL? The LDL cholesterol is less than 50, considered as a low. And if it is less than 20, it is extremely low. Intensive lipid lowering treatment has been found to halt the progression of atherosclerosis as compared to moderate lipid lowering therapy. And it also reduces the atrium of plug burden volume as reported by several trials. Therefore, the standardized risk factors, which are modifiable, should be targeted properly. And proper level of targeted blood cholesterol should be achieved by hyperlipidemic drugs. And in India, hypercholesterol is the most important form of dyslipidemia, which is amenable to therapy. Awareness and treatment of hypercholesterol and diabetes is very low. And we should be working regarding this so that the primary prevention can have a very important role in prevention of occurrence of this particular disease. Lastly, uh, 
few important aspects of statin use in COVID-19. Can use of statins be a benefit in people with COVID-19? Tool like receptor recognize pathogen associated molecular pattern, PAM, on virus and other pathogens. And together with a set of adapter proteins, activate a signaling cascade that activates nuclear factor kappa beta or trigger inert immunity. Myeloid differentiation primary response 88, the molecule is the main adapter protein for the majority of C-star toll like receptors. And statins are known tailor MYD88 pathway antagonist. They stabilize these molecule levels during hypoxia and stress, thereby mitigating the NFKB activation. The effect of SARS-CoV-2 on this receptor is pathway is largely, however, unknown. However, extrapolating findings from studies have shown that, and it is postulated that the effect of statins on such gene expression might prevent SARS-CoV-2 induced lung injury. Therefore, statins reduce the serum concentration of systemic inflammatory biomarkers like CRP and causes downregulation of nature factor capability, suppression of cytokines, chemokines with resulting anti-inflammatory effects. By restoring the redox balance in the vascular endothelium, statins reduce the vascular inflammation triggered by oxidative stress, and it may reduce the lung injury induced by excessive angiotensin II. They are also effective in main protease inhibitors. Therefore, it may be helpful in the treatment. However, we do not have any robust data, neither do have any randomized control trial, to recommend de novo initiation of such therapy in COVID-19 patients. However, your progression to date has been associated with atorvastatin 40 MD in patients with COVID-19 admitted to ICU, and non-users had a 73% chance of faster progression to date compared with atorvastatin. This study was published in uh, retrospective course of the Critical Care Journal in 2020 and uh, by Rodriguez et al. Uh, this is not what we're recommending right now. What is current status is that people with COVID-19 who are already on certain therapy for an underlying comorbid conditions should continue unless and until they have a specific contraindication. However, de novo use of statins in people with no underlying comorbidity might be beneficial, but still avoids substantiation in clinical trials. So there are several proposed trials. So to conclude this session, lastly, I'd like to say that all initiation of control of risk factors such as LDL can prevent need for interventional procedures. Early intervention is helpful in prevention of ACS and is cost effective for patients. Barriers for primary and secondary prevention must be addressed. Patient education about acute syndrome, risk factor, lifestyle changes, medication adherence are critical.